Let me introduce Jim Mercy. I think Jim's position at CDC is Special Advisor for Global Health in the Division of Violence Prevention in the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. Jim has been a pioneer in developing the public health approach to violence prevention and has been at CDC for close to 30 years working on this. From about 1973 to about 2014 is about 30 years. It's a long time to devote one's career to this issue, but I think Jim has contributed to a lot of changes and most recently has been working in the area of doing surveys to find out about the impact and extent of child abuse and injury and violence against children in developing countries. So Jim, I didn't want you to have to use your five minutes for that. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Well, congratulations to the planning committee and the forum on another wonderful workshop. Um, I think one of the, the great things about this workshop was focusing on the topic of violence and mental health um, forced us in a way to address suicide and interpersonal violence together in a way that we often don't. We often silo these issues and discuss them separately. But I think in this forum, in this workshop, more than any other, we came together around these issues and and in, in several important ways. I have three points I want to make. Um, the first is to counter a statement that was made several times during this workshop that suicide is more important than homicide or, or interpersonal violence. I think that's a very misleading statement for several reasons. Um, the first of which is that it's true if you base your consideration of health as a life or death issue. But obviously, public health, health is much more than a life or death issue. People living with mental illness have reduced qual health-related quality of life. People suffering from disabilities or pain. Um, so this is one reason why globally now they're using measures such as disability-adjusted life years to reflect the burden of health in countries and in the world and to measure progress because they're trying to have a measure they're not trying to rely not just on measures of mortality, but also of measures that include morbidity and mortality. Another reason why I think the statement is misleading is because we've learned that interpersonal violence has a profound effect on a wide range of health outcomes, including potentially, and the evidence is mounting, chronic diseases such as diabetes, cancer, heart disease, all contribute to premature mortality. So if you just think of the direct measures of homicide and suicide, you don't take into account the indirect ways that exposure to interpersonal violence in particular can influence premature mortality. The other reason, I think, is because when you say something is more important than another, it downplays the cross-cutting nature of the factors that contribute to these problems. We've had several workshops here today, one on alcohol, one on firearms, um, and Hendricks mentioned early interventions that address both mental health and violence outcomes, all of which address factors that cross-cut these two important issues that we've addressed in this workshop. So um, my first call is really to emphasize more this research that, that builds upon the cross-cutting factors that influence both um, suicide, suicidal behavior and interpersonal violence. The second point I want to make is that is a lot of this workshop focused on the impact of mental illness on violent behavior. But there's another important impact uh, relationship between violence and mental health, and that is the influence of exposure to violence on mental illness. Um, Ron Kessler, using the uh, World Mental Health Surveys in 21 countries, found that um, um, the that childhood adversity, which is primarily exposure to violence during childhood, accounted for 30 percent, with the population attributable fraction in this study, was 30 percent of adult, adult psychopathology in those 21 countries. Now, that's an amazing impact. That's not a moderate or weak impact. That's a strong and important impact. And, real, and we also know, as several people have mentioned, we have effective treatments for addressing um, uh, the effects 
of exposure to violence, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, for example. Um, so I think this is an area where we need dissemination and implementation research. This is an area where we're ready to scale up, particularly in low and middle income countries. One great example of this research is, is by uh, is Judy Bass and Laura Murray and her colleagues at Johns Hopkins have been studying uh, using cognitive behavioral therapy with victims of violence in, in, in Africa in which they train health community workers to implement the, 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 the therapy and find it to be effective um, in addressing the, the sequel of that problem. Another issue I'd like um, that I think needs to be addressed in this context is whether it's this issue of whether treatment is prevention. Do these treatments actually in the long run actually reduce interpersonal violence and suicidal behavior? So are they actually in a, a form of primary prevention themselves? And finally, I think, um, I think we'll all agree that we need research uh, addressing the um, intersection between mental health and the means of perpetrating violence. Um, you know, Daniel Webster and Michael Phillips all talk both about the lethality of certain means. In the United States, over 80% of suicide attempts with firearms are fatal. About 20% of assaults with firearms are fatal. It's a highly lethal means. Michael talked about the lethality of, of pesticide poisoning. Um, we need to do research in the area, as Mark said earlier, to respect the legitimate rights of gun owners, but at the same time to advance our ability to prevent injuries associated with this problem. Um, I think several of the needs that are important in this area are needs for better data linking mental illness and violent death and behavior. Part of the trouble, difficulty that Daniel Webster had in showing us the paucity of research on, uh, in, on suicide and, and firearms and interpersonal violence and firearms around policies is that policy researchers rely a lot on administrative data that are readily available. And many of those the sources of administrative data lack the, the connections uh, between these, these issues that we need to do better policy research. Um, one area where this would, uh, one data set where this is uh, uh, trying to improve this, particularly for suicide, is the National Violent Death Reporting System, which is linking data on mental illness and, and, um, and suicide in that, behavior, in that data system. Two other areas quickly to uh, focus on this is one, the uh, need to further understand firearm access to firearms particularly among people who uh, suffer from mental illness or are otherwise at risk of hurting other people. We need much more information about how they get access, where they get the guns, why do they carry them, how do they use them. And finally, and most importantly, we need better research on what works in this area. Res research on, for example, uh, this area of is, firearm, is physician counseling effective in reducing um, use of guns and, and suicidal behavior, as well as do background checks, for example, are they effective in keeping people at risk of perpetrating uh, violence against others of themselves from getting access to firearms? Thank you very much.